Hello and welcome back to another section of notes. Today we are continuing with what we're talking about related to the French Revolution, but today we're going to be focused more on the radical stage. If you remember what we talked about last class, we had discussed everything that really went on in the French Revolution leading up to the Constitution in 1791. And again, that's where we're going to kind of pick up. While we have a new constitution okay, that's passed, we do see progress, right? The big thing is, is that the power of the monarchy is limited, that we have a constitutional monarchy now, which sets up the legislative assembly as that separate branch while the monarch or the king is still the executive of uh, the, the government in place in France. The problem is, is that you have factionalism really start to rise. And this comes about because the different factions that existed during the constitutional drafting in 1791, we see them start to pull even further and further apart. You have radicals that are the Jacobins that really, they're opposing any idea of monarchy altogether. They basically view 1791 as the halftime for the French Revolution, that it's not done until they are able to fully topple the monarchy. You also have the moderates that fall somewhere in the middle, and they want some changes. Uh, they, in some cases, wanted more, but their result of a legislative assembly and a constitutional monarchy really fills a lot of the the desires of the moderates and therefore they basically view the revolution as done. Conservatives, on the other hand, largely happy with the fact that you have few changes that move through. While they're okay with the constitutional monarchy, they probably would have been happier with the status quo uh, and maybe a few changes socially. But again, the conservatives being the ones that are the least uh, open to change. Now, here's the thing, is that what's going on at France at this time is pretty radical in terms of greater Europe. The other monarchs of Europe are basically looking at what's going on in France and they're saying, oh shoot. This is really bad, mainly because it disrupts uh, the status quo of things in Europe, but it also could be a problem for us that maybe these ideas spread or that the mob of France decides they're going to take over and that this is going to spread elsewhere as well uh, across France's borders. This is at the time where we start to see this paranoia um, also within the legislative assembly that they're afraid of intervention. And basically due to this prodding back and forth, we see that the legislative uh, assembly, they declare war on Austria and Prussia, kind of the two big central European players at this point. And by 1792, the Prussians have basically advanced into uh, the area around Paris. Because of this, we see that there's mass protests. Uh, mob violence is taking place. People are extremely upset because you have a foreign army on the on the uh, the outskirts of Paris. And what we see because of this is the legislative assembly uh, is suspended and the constitution that was passed in 1791 is actually officially dissolved. And this really comes about because of the push of the Jacobins, the Jacobins being the radical group that really want to end the monarchy altogether. They're very good at stoking kind of the, the mob mentality within Paris uh, and in France at this point. You have this uh, from Jean-Paul Marat, who is a, an editor of a paper at the time that basically is calling for all those that continue to support the king. Hey, they're as good as dead, too. The National Convention is what's convened after this. It's a radical government that's created by the Jacobins. And the National Convention is different than the Legislative Assembly. Why? Well, the Legislative Assembly was kind of a variety of different views, whereas this is much more centralized on the Jacobin agenda. They want to get rid of the monarchy, right? And they do. They abolish the monarchy. So the king is now a regular old citizen, that he is... Joe who lives down the street instead of being King Louis the 16th. 
This also creates a republic where the people vote for their government. They vote for representatives to represent them in the government. This is all the while we still have war going on with other uh, European powers. That it expands at this point that Great Britain gets involved, Holland or the Netherlands, as well as Spain are now also involved in war against France. So this is where we really can pick up moving forward here. Uh, the sparks that really ignite what most people think of when they think of the French Revolution comes about during this time period. Uh, Louis and his family had basically been held prisoner since 1791. They try to escape France, and it goes pretty terribly uh, to the point where they are now uh, prisoners of the state. The National Convention comes to power. They put Louis and Marie on trial for treason, that they say that the actions of the king and queen are actions that are against the government of France, and they're found guilty of this, that the, the courts then uh, and the people, they decide that Louis and Marie are therefore uh, eligible for execution, and they are beheaded in front of the Parisian crowd uh, by guillotine, that their heads are chopped off. This becomes, again, the bloody symbol of the French Revolution, but also the kind of bloody symbol that monarchy has officially been toppled from France. While a lot of people associate this with the kind of big violent uh, and mob rule that takes place during the French Revolution, it is important to point out that a lot of French citizens do feel that this is where the revolution goes too far, that by executing the monarchs, that was a kind of a bridge too far and things were going to get worse before they got better. Those people would be correct. What happens between 1793 and 1794 is commonly referred to as the Reign of Terror. And the reason for that is that the National Convention creates this committee, and they call it the Committee on Public Safety. And the leader of it is this guy named Maximilien Robespierre. And Robespierre becomes infamous because of this committee. The committee essentially deals with the quote-unquote enemies of the revolution. So people that were suspected of not being good revolutionaries or actually fighting to try to stop the revolution, they are seen as enemies and are going to be taken care of. What this reign of terror really looks like is basically a year where the revolution turns into this very bloody, bloody chapter. And effectively, you have Robespierre ruling the mob as a pseudo dictator of France at this point in time. What he's able to do with the Committee on Public Safety is he's able to sentence 40,000 men, women, and children to death because, again, they were seen as enemies of the revolution. A lot of these individuals were publicly executed, that these criminals were executed by guillotine, which, again, is why we associate the French Revolution with this form of execution uh, and people's heads getting severed. Again, 85% of the people, though, that are killed are from the third estate. So again, it's not as if this is isolated just to the first estate or the royal family or the second estate. There are people from the third estate in pretty large quantities that are also getting killed. Even Robespierre, he ends up uh, at a point where he is arrested. Why? Because the National Convention starts to fear for their own safety that Robespierre might come after them. So he's arrested and at executed, and that effectively ends the reign of terror. But again, this is a year uh, that's a very, very bloody and kind of the dark chapter of the French Revolution. What comes about after the National Convention, because they cannot bring peace, just like the National Assembly could not bring peace, what we see is this group called the Directory. And the Directory was a government, but essentially it was a more moderate form of government with moderates that are involved. The idea was basically that you had these five directors that could meet and they could decide how things would work in France. The problem with this is though they were more moderate than the Jacobins, they're really corrupt 
and there wasn't a ton of problem solving that takes place. We still see issues related to the wars that France is dealing with, along with the underlying economic issues. People still are hungry, taxes are still too high, people need these problems to be solved. And what ends up happening is that essentially you start to have the military be really the key stabilizing force in France. And a general in particular named Napoleon Bonaparte, he ends up kind of rising to notoriety uh, during this time. We'll talk a little bit more about Napoleon next class. So I hope that you listen to our section four of our notes moving forward as well. But again, thank you for listening. I hope this was insightful. Uh, and again, tune in next time as we talk more about Napoleon. Thanks.